and it only promises to even be more tumultuous. It's a crazy world in which we live right now. Not only what's happening inside the United States with the presidential election and all of the rhetoric that has surrounded it, but across the world. The stories that were read this morning in the scripture really could sound like front page headlines when it starts talking about wars and famine and pestilence and earthquakes and it's almost like a checklist. You could go, yeah, that's going on, yeah, that's going on, yeah. I mean, all right now. And the way most people respond to what they see on the news is, quite frankly, to be afraid. And the reactions are either in that fear to watch the news as much as possible so that there's some almost mastery. Maybe if I know enough about what's going on, I'll, I'll feel more settled in my life. Or the opposite is the case. I'm just going to turn it off and not pay attention and sort of just act like it's not happening at all. So how odd it is in the midst of this sort of tumult to hear the words of the canticle out of the book of Isaiah. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. Now that works, except if you're really listening to the scriptures when Jesus begins to tell his stories to his own disciples and says things like, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. They will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. That doesn't sound a lot like deliverance, does it? Are you there? So what is Jesus talking about? What does it mean somehow to be protected even in the midst of difficulty? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're saved out of bad circumstances. That's a part of what's self-evident. Although it does happen and churches are always filled with stories about how at the very last minute God showed up and it, I never expected it and I prayed for it but I wasn't sure it was going to happen but deliverance came. You fill in the blank about how that occurs. I've got stories like that in my life too, for which I am profoundly grateful. But I also hear the stories, especially of persecuted Christians. As I said to those who were being confirmed prior to the early service, we are, you are being confirmed into a, a communion, a church that is actually global. And so that means we have in our own communion sisters and brothers in Jesus in other parts of the world especially who are suffering for their faith, who have experienced the confiscation of their property, who have been marginalized and mistreated, prejudicial things have been spoken, and some have even lost their lives. Now we're not, so it's not just like it's out there. And in fact, because at least my experience is the more I get involved in this global Anglican communion, more what begins to happen to me is when I hear these scriptures, I see faces. I think of families, I know, and people who firsthand have experienced the kind of marginalization, derision, loss of financial income because they had to flee the country because they were immigrants or because their property was confiscated because they were Christians and some who have lost relatives to martyrdom. It is a present day reality. Instead, so it doesn't always mean we, we get to escape difficulty. And in fact, as I also said to the confirmands, if they are being confirmed, who's been confirmed? What did I say? Remember, the first thing is the prayer protection over your head, the sign of the cross on your forehead and oil, which is the Holy Spirit. And what's the third thing? You can say it out loud. Yeah, what happens is this happens, although it's not that hard. 
And that is a reminder that the commitment to serve Jesus means you could end up in difficulty. Not just because you're a cranky person. Not just because sometimes bad things happen because they do. That's a part of what it means to live in a broken, fallen world. But sometimes, genuine opposition begins to happen because of your commitment to Jesus Christ. That's what this means. And it's a commitment that is being made by those who are confirmed to serve Jesus even when it gets difficult. As I said to them, confirmation is not for whiners. And neither is the Christian life. In fact, what happens is the scripture kind of lays, this, lays out a choice. On the one hand, a commitment to follow Jesus and the extraordinary promises that accompany it about God working in us endurance, about being with us every single step of the way, about knowing the companionship of his presence, and the future deliverance that actually results in a new heaven and a new earth. The Isaiah reading, where the wolf lies down with the lamb, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, they shall not learn war anymore. That's heaven, and it's on its way. That's what Isaiah is really telling us. It's exactly what happens in the book of Revelation, those are the lessons that are read at every single funeral. My hope in Christ is that when my body dies, what will happen to me is that I will stand in the presence of the Lord. And I will be in that place where there is no pain, where there is no grief, where God wipes away every tear and every eye. And if it was sickness that got me to the shade of death, God will say to sickness, no, you don't. You can't come with him. And I will be taken into the presence of God where there will be no more sickness or any disease. Death will be no more. That's the future. But it's not now. The now is the eternal presence of God lives in us in the midst of a body that is often subject to disease and illness, to circumstances that can sometimes be neutral, sometimes go well, sometimes actually be an assault of the evil one, sometimes the very blessing of God operating in our lives. All of the above. It's like a banquet. So how do we live in the midst of all of that becomes the question. Because I want to live on the side of faithfulness. I want to live on the side of endurance. I want to live on the side of knowing the promises of Jesus in the midst of this, the upheavals that are going on in my life. It's easy to thank God when everything's going well. It's not so easy when things aren't going well. And I want to be one of those people who continues to be faithful whether things go well for me or whether they don't. Because if I'm not stepping into that, what I'm stepping into is what the Thessalonian lesson describes as idleness. Now the specific application in the lesson has to do with people who don't work. They're just kind of hanging around living off of other people. And Paul is saying in the body of Christ we should all be putting in our fair share. Everybody works, everybody, get, everybody gets to share the table. That's the, but idleness in the Bible is much bigger than whether you're working for a living or not. Idleness has to do with a kind of self-centeredness where you just don't know what to do and therefore you don't do anything. Or if you are doing something, it means you're, this is the other word in Second Thessalonians, you're a busybody. What was the line? I can't remember. It was an interesting translation. You're not a busy person, you're a busybody. Because you're more interested in what's going on in the lives of other people and you're a gossip. More often than not, people who are busybodies have too much time on their hands. But what's true for the idol, regardless of who they are, is they have no purpose. And therefore, that's at the heart of why they gossip, why they don't, aren't particularly productive. So they're just kind of making it up. And they're the ones who are the most vulnerable to the fear factor that comes through the newscast every single day. Because nothing grounds them. They have no sense that somehow in the midst of all of that turbulence, 
they're going to be taken through it. They have no assurance of the companionship of God. They have no purpose. Now believe me, brothers and sisters, if the choice is, do I want to live with endurance and purpose, or do I want to be an idle busybody, that's an easy one, right? And believe me, you can work 24-7 at your job and still be an idle busybody if you're not living with purpose. If you don't have a life that is committed into the purposes of God. It, it starts straight from the beginning when the prayer that was offered from the back of the church, what we call in our language the collect of the day, which is a prayer, and it leads us to the scriptures. Blessed Lord who causes all scripture to be written for, notice, our learning. Learning. In other words, straight off the bat, what we're met, saying in that prayer is, you know, I really don't know a lot, a lot about the Bible. And I need to be a learner. And I want to say to you, as somebody who's a seminary graduate, who's done doctoral work, who's been ordained for 40 years, this year, the fact of the matter is, I feel like I'm just getting started. And in fact, I know less now than what I thought I knew <laughs> when I was just getting started. Because that's a part of the arc of learning. The more you get into a subject, the more you begin to discover how vast it really is. And out of that, I'm actually being invited into a place of both being a learner, which means I'm hungry to know, and I'm hungry to know not just the content of a book, I'm hungry to know a person. And therefore, I want to grow in my relationship with Jesus. It, it invites us into a kind of gentle humility. Childlikeness, you see, is the model for discipleship in the Bible. Not the, I know who I am, I know where I'm going, I got this. A four-year-old, unless he's a spoiled brat, never says, I got this. <laughs> no, no, a child... That childlikeness is the very expression of dependency, of a need to be led, of a tremendous amount of curiosity. What's that? Drives you crazy, doesn't it? <laughs> because there's a hunger to learn and to know. That's really the attitude of a disciple. Humility, hunger, curiosity, the desire to know, and the desire to draw closer to the one who is discipling us, who is Jesus himself. And it is in that vista that I become the one who is being shaped by Jesus, made more like him. And out of that, God's gift, beginning to receive a level of inner stability and character that allows me to continue to move forward, even when life is at its worst, not as I define what worst is, but as the Bible defines as what is worst. Persecution, famine, sword, war, rumor, war, all of those things. And I've seen it. I've seen it in the faces of people I know who have faced all of those things. There is such a sweet gentleness about them. There's such a quiet joy. It's exactly the opposite of what you might expect. What you'd expect is tough, embittered, cynical. But actually the opposite is the case. And it's not that they're not tough. Boy, let me tell you. But what's really true is, is that God has worked in them that kind of childlike dependency that allows them to trust even when they're facing the point of a gun. So what do you want? What do you want? Who do you want to become? Are you interested in God work, working in you along the path, and He does so with infinite patience? That kind of childlike humility, that kind of hunger to learn and to grow, the willingness to lay aside the childish things which in this case are that kind of cynical independence 
and that tendency to be way too interested in what's going on in the lives of other people. Some people take a perverse pleasure in knowing the latest and they're happy to tell you. That is not the mark of a believer. It's a, the mark of an idle busybody. These who are making their commitments this morning are saying, I want the former, not the latter. I want God to work in me what it means to be a disciple. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want the changes to happen. And even if it means tough circumstances, I'm willing to continue to step forward. It's no surprise. I knew what was coming. It would happen to me. I'm not being somehow relieved of that. Instead, I'm experiencing the supernatural presence of Jesus in the midst of it. And I know that he's going to get me through. So that when my time comes, whether I'm here or whether I'm here, the body will get shed. I will stand before the presence of God. There will be that place where there is no pain or grief. I'll be welcomed in it, and I will say it was worth every minute. That's what these are committing themselves to. And you also, as you reaffirm the commitments that you made when you were confirmed, when you were received, it's big stuff. That's why you say, I will with God's help. Because we're just getting started. And there's so much that God wants to do both in us and through us. So heed the call to the choices you make. Ask God to give you all that you need to be that kind of humble, joy-filled, curious disciple a learner who's being made like Jesus. That's the invitation. And I hope you with me will say to those commitments, I will with God's help. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, I thank you that you are so incredibly patient with us. That you smile at our folly and come to our aid even when we resist you. That you always bring forgiveness and mercy. And you pick us up again when we fall. There is no other God like you. And so help us, O oh God, to continue to yield to your authority. That we might continue and even more deeply call you Lord. And we thank you that we are yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen.